Hi, and welcome to our first lecture in Positive Psychology, the Science of Well-Being. Today, we're going to take a look, just kind of a quick overview at um, exactly what is positive psychology and what's the history of it, how we got to where we are today. Um, and then also to take a look at some positive psychology in action, which is something that we're doing at Gateway. So that's kind of exciting. Um, I'm Carrie Sanderson. I'm your adjunct faculty instructor for this course. I'm also a full-time employee of Gateway Community College as the project manager senior for well-being and engagement. And you'll learn a little bit about that today and a little bit more as we go so this is what we're going to look at today exactly. Um, why does all of this matter? What is positive psychology and kind of what it isn't? And how, how did we get there through the course of, of modern psychology? And um, a little bit about some of the, the theories behind it, the theories of well-being. And then finally, we'll take a look at what we're doing at Gateway. Um, I like to start all of my lectures and all of our gatherings with a little bit of centering. We'll talk a lot about mindfulness in this course, so we'll start almost at every lecture with some sort of meditation. Um, so let's, this is my one of my very favorite, we want to be present, we want to be um, kind of centered and getting rid of, of things that are distracting us. So go ahead, you can um, close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. We're just gonna deep breathe through this meditation. So in, out, deep, slow, calm, Smile. Release. Present moment. Deep breath in. Wonderful moment. So just really quickly why this matters. Um, you'll hear, hear me mention a couple of times, probably <laughs> a lot of times maybe, that I actually discovered positive psychology a number of years ago and went to the University of Philadelphia or University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to study um, positive psychology, to study applied positive psychology. And I was really, really, really lucky and grateful to get to study with basically the folks that founded this entire field of psychology. And so just wanted to share with you um, two quotes by two of the heavy hitters in positive psychology that explain why I'm so excited to be able to teach this course at, um, at Gateway. So Dr. Martin Seligman, you'll hear a little bit more about him later says well-being is everyone's birthright. Students who have high well-being are not only happier, but they go on to get better grades, are just healthier, they go on to more success. So there's every reason to teach the skills of well-being alongside the traditional academic offerings and most especially in community colleges. And Dr. Angela uh, Duckworth, we will definitely be hearing more from her later in the semester. She agrees that well-being is universally important, but um, she believes there's a special need for supporting the well-being of community college students. We know there's a problem with completion. Um, our students are often, um, you know, have lots of stuff going on in their lives that they're dealing with that makes it sometimes hard to complete an entire program. And so, um, as Angela says, it's impossible to disentangle the academic outcome of graduation from the social, emotional, physical well-being. In other words, we need to take care of the whole student. So it's really important to think about 
learning the skills of well-being. There's lots of research that shows that students that have higher levels of well-being actually have higher levels of academic achievement. So just a really quick check in of where we are, just kind of how are we? This is um, for those of you that are fans of Schitt's Creek. This is Alexis Rose, I think, with the perfect expression of just like, what, what is going on? It's been the past um, now almost two years, a complete roller coaster. This is a word cloud that I did. I asked the folks in the audience to type in two words that described how they felt. And it's continuously been like this throughout the entire pandemic, this weird dichotomy of frustration and panic and sad and anxiety and overwhelmed and grief and all these really difficult emotions sort of combined with little glimpses of hope and gratitude and being kind of excited at, at some of the opportunities to maybe innovate and be more creative. So just checking in where you are, it's completely normal to feel both of those things. And it's been a roller coaster. So when we look at um, kind of what it looks like to manage a crisis, these are the stages. It's a little bit like, like grief. If you're familiar with the stages of grief, grief, there's shock and disbelief. There's sadness, there's anger, there's overwhelm, kind of all of these same things that you see here under an acute crisis. And as we move through the crisis, um, we sort of get used to it. It's going on around us. So we kept talking about the new normal. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Um, but we're just all so <laughs> exhausted and kind of numb. Pandemic brain is that sort of fogginess that comes from um, chronic stress combined with technology overload. The goal of managing a crisis is really to integrate it. And with something like a global pandemic, asking when this is going to be over is probably not the right question because it probably won't be over, but it's really just how do we adapt to this and how do we kind of accept, move forward, adapt to new conditions and allow ourselves to be hopeful again. So we'll talk a lot about hope and um, optimism in this course, but just kind of think of where you are and, and it chronologically, it's a straight line, but emotionally for us, it's not a straight line at all. So it's really important as we're learning about all these different components of positive psychology, what are the parts that not only are you going to be able to use to help other people, but also to help yourself. So whenever I talk about positive psychology, I get kind of two responses and I'll be curious to hear if any of you get these when you're telling people what you're taking this semester, people will say, oh, positive psychology as opposed to negative psychology, or they kind of have this re response of it being really new agey, um, people have this association with self-help, um, you know, just like pure optimism, irrational optimism, where you're seeing everything with rose-colored glasses and thinking kind of in denial, pretending everything is fine. And people also think it's kind of happyology, that it's um, all about happiness. And, and we'll talk quite a bit about that, but you will find that it is not all about happiness. What it is, is the science of a life well lived. Um, so these are some of the things that we're gonna talk about. It, positive psychology as a discipline aims to understand, research, and cultivate. So kind of theorizing, testing those theories, and then finding ways for us to um, build our own well-being to cultivate human flourishing in all these different ways, all these different kind of pieces that fit together to, to lead to a balanced well-being and a balanced life. So character strengths, positive emotions, I won't read all these. Um, you may or may not be familiar with some of these books that are here. I will give you lots and lots of information on resources but I think almost all of these topics we're gonna to talk about at some point in the course. So let's talk a little bit about the history of it. Um, 
what is a life well lived is a question <laughs> that's been asked since humans were alive. Kind of that question of why am I here? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? Philosophers and artists all throughout history have had opinions and, and talked about and debated and, um, you know, sort of come up with different philosophies to embody this all the way back to um, Eastern philosophy with the Buddha really focused on your character and being mindful about striving to be a better person. Um, our ancient Greek philosophers really focused again kind of on character and virtues and practicing those and those were the pathway to a good life and then um, poets, writers, playwrights, artists, sculptors, painters, everybody sort of ponders this, you know, the question of the meaning of life. So we have a famous line from Shakespeare. Um, psychology as a science didn't, didn't really appear until the kind of like mid to late 1800s. Um, William James actually was a philosopher. Um, but also one of the first social scientists to apply the scientific method to the study of humans. And so kind of looking at, um, you know, how observing how do humans behave, making hypotheses about, about human behavior and, and how to make our lives a little bit better. William James, um, because he was a philosopher, really focused on fulfillment in everyday life and how to find more meaning in our lives. But he also did think about, um, through this development of this new science of psychology, relieving mental suffering. And so as we kind of move a little bit through time into the 20th century, um, that that focus on fulfillment in everyday life sort of fell away and it really became this disease model sort of a doctor looking to find what's wrong make a diagnosis and fix that and so two of the most well-known um, psychologists psychiatrists both of them from that era when when psychology and psychiatry were really starting to gain traction were Sigmund Freud who um, believed that a lot of our mental disorders came from sublimated trauma from our childhood and so created this uh, process of psychoanalysis, which is having a conversation between a patient and a doctor to kind of get at those. And then Carl Jung um, created or devised analytical psychology, which was much more theoretical, kind of taking um some of the messiness of humans out of it and we move from there um there, the the impact of world war ii mid or early-ish to mid 19, uh, 20th century the impact of world war ii was that psychology became almost exclusively focused on the medical model so many veterans were coming back from the war um, there was this huge need for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and and kind of things that that were plaguing all of these soldiers that came back this huge population and so in order for it to be able to become kind of a living and to be able to treat all of these people that needed treatment, it became more medical. And so the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Medical Mental Disorders, which is this super gigantic book, unfortunately, was originally published in 1952. And it actually gave insurance companies a way to bill for treatment because these um, mental disorders were classified kind of along the lines of that um, B.F. Skinner was very influential in psychology in coming up with behaviorism so this was the concept that free will is kind of an illusion and we are working kind of instinctively and behaving instinctively on a system of rewards and punishments so we're 
conditioned to do the things we get rewarded for and where we pull away from the things that we get punished for. And so with a really well-conceived reward system, you basically could um, kind of modify people's behavior in the ways that you wanted to. The next way was a little bit later, um, kind of almost in response to that, how behaviorism really took free will and, and agency out of the picture. Um, there was a move towards a more holistic approach. So kind of the whole person, a person who has agency and can make choices and has needs that they're motivated by. And so I think most people are pretty familiar with um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So as, as we develop, we need to have certain types of needs met before we can really move on to the next one. And so when people aren't safe and when their physiological needs like food and water and sleep aren't met, they're not really able, they're not mentally well in most cases, they're not able to move on to the next levels because um, they're, they, it's important for them to, to physically take care of themselves first. And so you can kind of see love and belonging and then self-esteem and then self-actualization is that kind of ability to, to really come to your own um, kind of transcending into your, your very best self, your best potential. And that became really popular, but unfortunately that movement in psychology kind of suffered from a lack of empirical evidence. So it's, it's important for research to um, be valid, to be validated and to be, to be peer reviewed and to show empirically that the, the results are coming from particular components. And so that just didn't really happen as much with um, what was going on in, in humanism, although it was very influential in positive psychology. And so it kind of, um, a lot of those concepts just got sort of popularized and snatched up and became self-help. And right before I started doing this lecture, I Google or I looked on Amazon for how many, it just went to books and looked up self-help and there's 70,000 plus titles right now under self-help that you can buy off Amazon. So you can see there's a lot of really bad advice out there. So we wanna make sure that's one of the things that's really, really important about positive psychology is um, the rigor of the science. So the fourth wave, uh, Dr. Martin Seligman actually had a long history in psychology before he kind of came up with this idea and this push for positive psychology. He actually started researching um, a concept called learn helplessness. And we'll talk a little bit about that where people just give up. They just, they, they're, they're pushed back against so often that they just give up. And so it was kind of, that was, that was the seed for, positive psychology in that he was like, yeah, but what about the people who never give up? There's this small, when we do these studies, there's a small or, you know, sort of smallish number of people that keep trying no matter what. So he'd always kept it in the back of his mind to take a look at that. And there's kind of a story that goes that um, Dr. Seligman's daughter, who was five years old, he was in, in the garden with his daughter, Nikki, and he was very grumpy and he snapped at her and she said, Dad, I, I need to tell you something. You need to stop being so grumpy. I don't whine anymore, do I? For my fifth birthday, I said I was gonna learn not to whine. And if I can learn not to whine, you can learn not to be grumpy. And so that was kind of his aha moment of these are skills we can learn. Optimism versus pessimism, happiness, cheerfulness versus sort of grumpiness. Uh, everybody has kind of a set point and it's a spectrum, but these are skills that we can learn. And so Dr. Seligman got elected the president of the American Psychological Association in the late 90s and his speech that he gave, his ex acceptance speech, talked about this shift in orientation 
from focusing on what was wrong and starting to study what is good. How do we learn what makes a life well lived instead of philosophers, you know, sort of discussing it, like, let's test the theories, let's do some science on this. And so you'll have an assignment to read an article called an introduction positive psychology and it was published in the year 2000 in a millennial issue of American psychologists that was all about positive psychology which was huge and really really new and kind of controversial so Dr. Seligman and um, Dr. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi are the co-authors of that article that you'll have a chance to read and they're also considered the co-founders of positive psychology. So in this issue, you'll see talking about um, positive experience, positive personality and social context and the huge impact that that this shift in this this movement towards looking at positive psychology was that there actually started to be funding for it. So because of what we talked about with um, insurance companies paying for medical treatment there wasn't any money in positive psychology but as they were able to start to articulate the goals and some of the theories um, they were able to get more and more research funding and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about your strengths so just to take a look at what's the difference between um Diff between a positive intervention and what would be considered sort of a traditional psychological intervention, we like to call them red cape versus green cape. So red cape is putting out the fire, fixing what's wrong, neutralizing it, where green cape is more nurturing and helping move along the strengths and the positive things and creating and cultivating environments where those can develop, where flourishing can develop. Um, it, it, it's taking us not from neutral to, uh, to, or not from negative to neutral, but from neutral or good to great. So looking at how do we, how, we can make this better. How do we do this? So, um, it can also be some of the positive interventions can be preventative measures meditation deep breathing um, mindfulness are are actually used it for all ages you'll see little kids doing breathing exercises they learn about their strengths and it's really kind of an inoculation against some of the mental health issues that are prevalent in our teens and all of us these days so where will you find positive psychology? So obviously there's lots of research going on. There's lots of scientists. There's lots of therapists using positive psychology, lots of coaches, um, but it's, an, it's meant to be an applied science. So taking the sciences and being able to apply it to institutions, to organizations, to communities, to policy, to um, the, country of Bhutan, which I am dying to go to, they actually don't measure gross national product. They measure gross national happiness. That's what's important in that, in that country. It's really amazing. So you'll find positive psychology and the science of positive psychology and well-being being used in healthcare in medicine. We have a lot of healthcare programs at Gateway. So we're starting to intertwine a lot of these concepts into those courses. It also helps people who are in their illnesses um, to be able to manage them, to be able to stay hopeful. Education, positive education is fairly well established in K through 12, but we're really just now seeing it come into colleges. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Gateway and how that's meaningful to us. In the military, they, um, the Army teaches to all enlisted soldiers mental fitness. And that training for that program is done by some researchers from the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania who have studied resilience. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, organizations and workplaces, so focusing on the processes that kind of give life to our organizations rather than focusing on the things that are all going wrong 
and individual and collective strengths and how we can elevate those for flourishing both individually and in our communities, um, flourishing growth and resilience. And then finally, governments and communities are really taking this on as kind of an umbrella approach um, to, to policy. So I mentioned Bhutan, the United Arab Emirates has a huge, um, has a minister of happiness and huge programming around raising the the level of well-being in that country. Cincinnati, Ohio is kind of a whole well-being city, which is sort of unexpected, I think, but they've done a lot of work around that. And then Battery Park City in New York is as well. So just glancing at these again, take a look at them, see what catches your interest. We're actually um, gonna have a project to do throughout the court, the length of this course, which will kind of culminate in a final project. So start thinking about which topic would be of great interest to you. But um, to kind of close out the, the history of psychology, of positive psychology and what it is, we want to take a look at some of the details of it in practice. So we have at Gateway Community Implement Community College implemented the five C's of well-being culture. And we've had this in place for a couple years now, um, put a little bit on hold and, and reframed and refreshed a little bit due to the pandemic. But these are our five C's. They're based on a number of different well-being models that apply both to individuals and communities. So the first C is character. And that's developing strengths of character that enable us to be and do our best. Care is the second C, which is taking care of emotional, physical, and environmental needs. So taking care of your body, taking care of your mind and your heart, what's going on around you, um, everything we need to create the conditions for flourishing. So we think about that a lot at Gateway, the physical spaces, what's happening in the classroom, the services that we offer. The third C is connection, and that's fostering and maintaining close positive relationships and also a sense of belonging. We know that's really important for everybody to feel like they belong, like they matter, what, that, what they're doing matters, that um, they're able to, to be a part of a tribe, to be a part of a family. The fourth C is contribution. That's being a part of something bigger than ourselves, finding a purpose both for our students and their learning, and then also for our lives. So making sure that you know what your values are and what you're either doing in school or what you're doing in your work is really aligned with your values and is making a difference for other people. And then finally, career, um, making decisions that contribute both to career and life success. And we'll do a module on that. Prior to my current role, I actually was the director of career services at Gateway for almost 10 years. And so that's something that's really important to me and, and my interest in positive psychology kind of rolled in to that need and desire to help inspire people to be their best authentic Selves. So we launched these five C's of well-being um, in doing training and programming, and we actually were recognized in 2019 in the Global Happiness and Well-Being Policy Report that's put out by the United Nations for being the world's first well-being community college. There are a couple of four-year universities that have embraced well-being as part of their strategy, but Gateway is the first college to do that, and we're doing some really good stuff moving forward. We also applied for and were awarded um, a Title V Hispanic Serving Institution grant, which we wrote around well-being and positive education and so that was a huge, a huge support of really implementing all of the, the things that we're putting into place at Gateway. Um, that's over, we're in year three of that grant, so we still have two more years of funding to put some more amazing things into place. 
So to, to kind of give you an idea of um, what all of this looks like, I'll post these slides so you can see this a little bit more closely. We, um, in our new employee orientation, do a positive culture presentation, and we have all new employees do their via character strengths, which we will talk about a lot. Um, we have standards of excellence that are kind of the expectations of employees that are based on the five C's and being, you know, great employees, citizens, and taking care of our students and each other. We have all of our, or most of our academic advisors are trained in a lot of this. We have done lots and lots of training um, for, for people on the Gateway Campus and also other parts of the district. And um, CPD 150 is the Skills for College Success course. So that entire course at Gateway is infused with positive psychology. We're actually in the process district-wide of developing and designing a new first year experience 101 course that will be required of all incoming students starting in fall of 2022. And there's a number of Gateway representatives on that design team. And so that course that's gonna go out to all students is actually really deeply infused with positive psychology. So we do also go into the classroom and do kind of specific programming or interventions or activities for different programs. So think about the program that you're in here at Gateway and, and as we're going through this course, what might be helpful for your fellow students. Um, we actually uh, all have everyone in the course take this assessment. We identified a need for a positive non-cognitive intake assessment. So as students are coming into the college, um, we have all these questions that we want to ask students about. Do you have enough money? You know, do you have enough time? Do you have childcare? All these things that kind of make it feel really hard to start college when we know it's really hard to start college no matter what. Um, but when these things are sort of highlighted at the second you step across the doorstep, it's not a really positive thing. So we wanted to do an assessment that helps take a look at indicators, predictors of motivation and academic attainment and overall well-being. So we had a team um, of researchers from the University of Pennsylvania take a look at this for us. And we created an assessment that's based on the concept of grit and hope and career decision self-efficacy. And so I'll have everybody take that assessment and then we'll be talking about those different components a little bit later in the course. But just to know that these are some things that are being put in place and we're developing resources right now. So if that sounds interesting to you, that's another thing, another place you might be able to get involved. And so these are these. this is why we chose these. Um, Students that show that they're high in hope are shown to achieve a grade level higher, which is amazing than students who score assess lower in hope but their peers that are less hopeful. Grit is that combination of having a really important goal and having the perseverance to towards going after that goal for a long time. And so having a high level of grit positively impacts academic achievement and all sorts of other good things that lead to the probability of graduation. And then lastly, career decision self-efficacy. We know that if you know what it is that you want to do, um, you have a really clear vision of your career goal, and it's a goal that's both aligned with who you are and is meaningful in your community then you are much more likely to be motivated and to, again, complete your program. So that's the end of our very first lecture. Um, I always like to end again with a really positive thought. So this is how I'll leave you today. Um, today, look around and see the good. Be grateful for the simple things. Tell others you love them, 
have patience. Learn a new thing. We're doing that today. See the future as wonderful. Be extra kind. You have a gift and it's today. So lots of interesting information. And then this week, um, will have you do a uh, positive intervention, which is a positive introduction that you'll be able to either videotape or write and then post on one of the discussion boards and you can all get to know each other, which will be really, really cool. And don't forget to do the syllabus quiz and the online contract and the reading. And I think that's it, but I'll put it all, um, in Canvas for you.